This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. How does the book of the Revelation play out? If you've ever wanted to know the answer in detail, watch this episode tonight. Watch it again, take notes, teach others. If you will ever be questioned about why you believe what you believe about the end times, this is the episode that explains it all. Tonight, Michael Root presents episode four of The Mystery of Iniquity because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. You know, I had the privilege of watching a pre-release version of what you are about to see tonight. I've never seen anyone explain the series of events of the end times like Michael does in this episode of Mystery of Iniquity. It's truly amazing. It's detailed yet simple, and you're going to want to watch it again and again. It's episode four of Mystery of Iniquity based on Michael Rood's best-selling book of the same title. Also, it is the fourth Shabbat in the month of Tibet on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. And as you know, there are amazing photos of the real Mount Sinai area on this calendar. Some of these photos have never been seen or photographed before, and right now these calendars are 50% off. And once they're gone, they're gone. We're getting ready for a new calendar, but this one is still good until June of this year, so you still got a lot of use out of it as well. Uh, there's a lot going on with respect to uh, how you watch shows like Shabbat Night Live, that's what else is going on here, uh, and other programs that you see from A Rude Awakening International. So let's talk about that with the Chief Operating Officer of A Rude Awakening International. Please welcome Ted Clayton. Hi. Hey, Scott. How are you, Ted? Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for having me on today. Certainly. You know, folks got the uh, the new January newsletter, which we have in front of us here in their home. And uh, beyond Michael's letter at the front uh, page, the second page we encounter is something that looks like this. It says, uh, new streaming broadcast 24-7. What is this all about? Well, Scott, uh, we've decided to take a small hiatus from broadcast television right now until we finish the uh, third edition of the Chronological Gospels. But... Don't worry, there's still plenty of places that you can watch your favorite Chronological Gospels or Shabbat Night Live. Right now, you can go to michaelrood.tv or michaelrood.tv, the app, and you can watch us on Roku, you can watch us on uh, Apple TV, you can watch us on Amazon Fire, uh, those Amazon mm -hmm. Fire sticks that you just plug into Have your one television. In my house, yeah. And of course, uh, as always, you can watch us online, you can watch us on your iPhone or you can watch us on your uh, Android app. So right. plenty of places and don't worry, we'll be back on broadcast television very, very soon with the third season of the Chronological Gospels. I, know, I don't know how many people know this, but you know, uh, we also have podcasts, several podcasts, yes. including The Health Awakening, there's Shabbat Night Live, there's yes. your show, uh, Rude Radio. Yeah. And uh, I love listening to those in the car. If you have any kind of commute and you're Absolutely. traveling more than you know, 20, 30 minutes, great thing, go to your app or go to your, uh, your your podcast, right? And look up the Health Awakening. Look up Rude Radio. You'll find them there. Great stuff on there. It's, right. Some folks have never even discovered, and so lots of places to watch us uh, still while we're off television. And, and you know, the the average commute today is roughly around 30 minutes. So think about it. Every day that you're commuting, you can be uh, you can be listening in your car to the Health Awakening to the Chronological Gospels, to Shabbat Night Live, or any of Michael's other telecasts. So don't take a moment to miss, and don't forget, on the Amazon Alexa app. Ah, yes. You can listen on the Amazon Alexa app to Rude Radio 24-7, 365. Now there is a uh, there was some confusion as to how to start that. So we have said, uh, what, is the, what is the terminology? Launch, I think, I what, think is, what do you say? I think it's Open a root awakening. That's what it is. Open a root open awakening. Open a awakening. It'll come straight up. Now, don't forget, you have to enable the skill, the MichaelRood.tv skill. If you enable that skill on your Lex app, all you have to do is say, 
open a rude awakening, and boom, it'll happen. And you can find that uh, just on Amazon, yeah, uh, the just Amazon website. Amazon Prime, typically, the Amazon okay. Prime website. All right. Well, uh, as we talk about these things, uh, more exciting things coming up uh, in April. April 10th to 12th is, of course, Passover 2020, the Red Sea Crossing. and It's uh, going to be incredible. Oh, gosh. You know, uh, Michael and uh, Tim have been talking recently about doing a series here with Tim. Yes. And uh, that is coming up as well. Lots of exciting detail about that incredible. coming up. But, uh, the more urgent thing about Passover is that there are only two weeks left now as of this Friday, well, as of today, as of today. Uh, to get your ticket and save $40 per adult or youth ticket. Right. And uh, that's, that's a real great bargain. It's $1.99 per person for youth or adult. It goes up to $2.39 right. as of February 1st. So you don't want to wait till that deadline. And already there's how many folks? Uh, oh, gosh. As of, as of this right now, I think there's 250, <laughs> roughly 250 wow. people who have already signed up. And we still got quite a ways left. But man, the, the whole Passover 2020 is gonna be incredible. First of all, we're gonna have David Salinas there with wonderful praise and worship, the praise and worship like you've never heard before. We're also gonna have Tim Mahoney there and we're gonna be worldwide debut of his latest movie, Patterns of Evidence, The Red Sea. Uh, is it the Red Sea or Red the Sea? Red sea, sea Miracle Red is what sea he's Miracle. calling it, yeah. That's right. And it's gonna be episode number two. So by then, episode one will have already played, but you're gonna see it at Passover, right there, for the first time anywhere in the country. And it's just gonna be fantastic. So he's kind of doing a Star Wars thing. He's got episode one, episode yeah. two, <laughs> the same it. title, and what is it? No, no he's, <laughs> he's got one from the Egyptian perspective, which yes. is coming out in... Uh, in February. February, very soon, next month, coming out mm -hmm. in February. Uh, and that's the, from the Egyptian perspective. Yes. And then the one you're going to see at Passover, like Ted says, is the Hebrew perspective. Correct. And uh, that is, uh, I think you already said, that is a world premiere. That We're gonna be the first to see it, right? Right, it doesn't premiere uh, into the country until May, I believe. Oh my Gosh. But we're going to be able to see it first in April. Wow, that's amazing. And of course, there's all the exciting stuff that comes with Passover. You've got oh. the matzah mixer. You've got uh, Michael's classic telling of the uh, of the crucifixion and all that that's with right. the Seder. So all of that is coming up as Circle well. Circle the wagons. Circle Michael's the wagons. Intimate oh, time. Yeah. Yes, it's going to be incredible. And the mikvah, too. Uh, if you've mm -hmm. ever wanted to be baptized, but you, know, you didn't want to go to a a regular church and be baptized. You want to know what's the deeper meaning? Where did this start from? Michael knows the deeper meaning. He can teach it to you. And typically we have about, well, I don't know, between anywhere between 50 and 80 people that get mikvahed right. uh, at Passover. That's the last thing we do before we leave. Right. And uh, some folks will actually just move their flight time so they can attend that. Uh, that's going to be somewhere near... Uh, Sunday afternoon, I guess, is that No, correct? actually Sunday morning. It's oh, actually Sunday gonna morning. be okay. little changes this year. We're gonna be doing Circle the Wagons on Saturday afternoon and the Mikvah Sunday morning just because of people having to leave and just because of those plane flights. We're just gonna go ahead and get it done early in the morning so people can be there and be a part of that. Now, as far as watching that movie, we do not have broadcast no. rights for this movie. So if you wanna see it, you have to be yeah, in attendance to, be there. You to gotta see it. Be there. The door's gonna be closed. It's kind of a secretive thing. Yeah. Uh, Tim Mahoney, being the filmmaker, has the, the rights to say, I want these folks to see it. And you know, he is the only one that has that call, so. And oh, by the way, he's gonna have an intimate time with the people there of questions and answers about how did you make the movie? What what made you want to make this movie? So mm -hmm. just incredible time at Passover 2020 this All year. All right, well, get your tickets, PassoverCharlotte.com or call us at 888-766-3610. Thanks for joining us today, Ted. Uh -huh. All right, if you've ever wanted to know the answer in detail, watch this episode tonight, watch it again, take notes, the answer all about the revelation. Teach it to others once you see it. It's Michael Rood coming up with episode four of Mystery of Iniquity. And up next, it's the Kiddush to bring in the Sabbath with bread and wine, stay tuned. Figuring out what the Almighty wants you to do with your life is hard enough. But what do you do when your believing friends and family share advice from the Holy Spirit that just doesn't seem to make sense? Michael Rood shares what Paul the Apostle did in a situation like this in a new teaching called, Don't Go to Jerusalem. But who wants to go to Jerusalem? Who says, I don't count my own life dear, I just wanna finish this thing. He was tired. Don't Go to Jerusalem by Michael Rood reveals the behind the scenes story you've never heard about Paul's decision to face persecution head on. 
an inspiring call to run our race as believers in courage and faith. This groundbreaking teaching is not for sale. It's a gift from Michael Rood in appreciation for your $50 donation to help spread the truth of the Messiah's ministry. Donate $100 or more and you'll also receive a handmade resin and stainless steel wine cup depicting a scene from ancient Jerusalem. Plus a pewter mezuzah containing a miniature Torah scroll. Hang it in your doorway to welcome everyone who enters your home. Or for a gift of $300 or more, you'll receive Don't Go to Jerusalem, the resin and stainless steel cup, the pewter mezuzah, plus this gorgeous pewter plate featuring scenes from the second temple and a twin ram's horn shofar candle holder. Get this collection now, available in January only. It's a gift from Michael Rood to thank you for helping to spread the true message of the Messiah through a Rood Awakening International. You'll get the Don't Go to Jerusalem teaching for a love gift of $50, the teaching, the stainless steel cup, and the pewter mezuzah for a gift of $100 or more. Or get everything plus the pewter plate and ram's horn candle holder for a love gift donation of $300 or more. Get these gifts now while supplies last. Call 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or visit monthlylovegift.com. The last night that Yeshua was with his disciples, the last supper before the Passover was sacrificed, he took bread and he took wine. He said before that Abraham saw his day and rejoiced, but what does that mean? He saw his day and rejoiced. Well, it was the Melek Zadik, the king of righteousness that brought forth bread and wine to Abraham. He blessed the Most High with the blessing that Abraham taught Yitzhak, Yitzhak taught Yaakov, and is still spoken today. Whenever bread and wine is served at a Jewish table, whenever it is Sabbath, especially around the world, the bread and the wine are brought forth with this blessing. Baruch atah Yehovah, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, borei pari hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, king of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua then said, blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. This represents my shed blood that pays the sin penalty because of the broken covenant. As often as we do this, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. So break the bread, share the wine, and we do this in remembrance of him until he comes. In Paul's second letter to the believers in Thessalonica, he reveals the details of what must take place before the Messiah returns. And part of that explanation, he says, because, because the mystery of iniquity is already at work. The term mystery of iniquity only appears once in the scriptures, and it is laden with meaning that we really need to have a command of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation to see how it all fits. And so if you do not have this under your belt, I'm going to fill in some of the details for you to hopefully uh, elucidate uh, the very legal prerequisites to the return of the Messiah, the things that must take place. Now, in Christendom, we have been told for many years that Jesus could return at any moment. Uh, there's a whole series of books left behind that's based on this one phrase, that the next rustle of the leaves, the next sigh, the next breath of the baby, Jesus could return. That is nothing but utter nonsense, it is literally heresy, it is denying everything that the scripture said. 
as Christians want to blame the Jews because they didn't see the Messiah's first coming, I blame the Christian world because they have completely missed the Messiah's second coming. They are all going to heaven when they die and sit on a cloud and play a harp and, and all sorts of nonsense that has been promulgated by Hollywood, by television, by stories, rather than what the scriptures say. And why has this happened? because the mystery of iniquity is already at work. There has been a snare that is set for the believers that they are all going to fall into. A scandalizo, as Yeshua used the word, as is recorded in the 24th chapter of Matthew, a scandalizo, a snare that has been set in the normal habit patterns, the normal expectation of the Christian world that is going to cause them to hate and betray each other because their expectation of what it's going to look like before the Messiah comes is going to be rudely interrupted. And so that is why we are going into the details of the mystery of iniquity. As it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse seven, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And it has been at work since Satan, Satan took its rebellious stand against God and subsequently against man. The mystery, the behind the scenes working, has to be understood and it's laid out very clearly in the scriptures. Paul talks about this uh, when he speaks of Satan as the God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. He said, the God of this world, which is Aeon, which is the God of this age, has blinded the minds of those that do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Messiah, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. When Satan blinds the eyes of those who do not believe, when they are completely engulfed in this religious fairy tale of evolution, when they think that this whole conscious physical experience we call life is just the result of millions of years of aberrant chance mutations in a purely mechanical universe, there is no God out there, everything is just happen chance, we are just dust in the wind, that's all we are is dust in the wind. As Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is all that is, all that was, and all that will ever be. This is a profoundly distorted sense of reality from an otherwise semi-intelligent mind, but someone whose mind has been blinded by Satan because they don't want to see the truth. They do not want to understand what this creation is about and their responsibility to just think that this whole physical world is and consciousness itself, which really can't be defined, it can't be described, it, it, it has no roots in evolution whatsoever that consciousness and God consciousness and morality just happened? Well, this can only be described by the atheist, by the blinded mind in a way that is just completely incomprehensible to those that do believe that there is a God. And those that believe there's a God believe that God has given rights and responsibilities to his creation. And as Solomon said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The wisest man, the wealthiest man on the planet said the conclusion of the whole matter, love God, keep his commandments. That is it. We love God, we fear him, we respect him. That's the beginning of knowledge. That's the beginning of understanding. And as it tells us in the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation is one of these parenthetical uh, chapters. The book of Revelation is really laid out beautifully in a chronology that Yeshua, when he begins to tell John what his job is, is to write the things that you've just seen, Yeshua, in all of his glory, his glorified body, walking among the, the congregations in Asia Minor, the seven stars in his hand, 
the representatives or his messengers to these assemblies. And he says, write the things you've seen, now write the things which are now, which is his communication to those believers and what they need to get straightened out. And if they do overcome these major hurdles that are still part of the entire Christian experience to this day, but if they overcome these, then there is a promise of a future which we will enjoy with Yeshua. Not in heaven, because he is not going to be in heaven. The gathering together on the sea of fire and glass takes place on the day of trumpets, Tishri 1. The marriage supper of the Lamb falls then 15 days later, the Feast of Trumpets, when we dine in the Mishkan in heaven, after the bowls of wrath are poured out, and then after that, Yeshua then returns to the earth to rule the earth with a rod of iron. For a thousand years, he reigns with his saints as priests and kings. That's our responsibility. Satan is bound during this period of time. And at the end of it, Satan is released. He goes out to deceive the nations of the world. And then they all converge on Jerusalem to destroy Yeshua, to try to, to overthrow him. Well, that's not gonna work out too well because the entire universe is going to be incinerated and then everyone's going to stand before Yeshua. Now, I said all that to, to tell you uh, this. this. This is where we have to start uh, plugging in the details in the Gospels on this. Because it was at the Feast of Shavuot, uh, the feast of what became known as Pentecost in Greek, but it's a Feast of Sevens, uh, Shavuot. Uh, this is the feast that every male Israelite is required to go up to, and it happens seven Sabbaths after the Day of First Fruits, which occurs during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover. And so then from the day of first fruits, Yom HaBikarim, we count seven Sabbaths and then we are required to be up in Jerusalem by Friday because we don't travel on the Sabbath and then on the Sabbath we rest and then on the first day, that is the high day of Shavuot. People come from all over the world to be there. The Jews that have been dispersed, the Israelites have been dispersed, they all come back uh, to, to Israel for that because the scripture says we are required. Every Israelite is required to be there. And so it is at this time, this is John chapter five, verse one, uh, which uh, the, the Greek version of John just says it was a feast of the Jews, which you know that very clearly lets us know that this is a Greek interpolation of this because no Israelite would ever say there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. We would say what the feast is. This particular feast, you just read the details and any Jew knows this is feast of Shavuot. But what does Shavuot mean? It means sevens. And so the original would have said, and it was a feast of Shavuot and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. Now any Greek reading that would say Shavuot, what is that? Well, that's sevens. The feast of sevens, what is that? They had nothing to relate to it too. There was no such thing as a feast of sevens in their culture. They're not required to go up to Jerusalem or any place, any pagan temple for their feast. This is Israel. This is Hebrew. And so they said, feast of sevens. And, and, and so they say, okay, what's that? Oh, that's a feast of the Jews. Okay, good enough. Close enough. There was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. All right. That, that's, there's so many things in the Gospel of John that, that just over and over 60 times it tells you this is all Greek version of a gospel that was originally in Hebrew. And even if we only had it in Greek, still it's describing a completely Hebrew culture. So Yeshua goes up to the feast. He's there by Friday because it has to be there by Friday. Everyone has to be there by Friday. The next day, they're relaxing uh, by the, the, the pool, and that is when there was a man who was lame there for 38 years who wants to get in the water and get healed. And this is the water coming from the spring of Yeshua, spring of salvation, into the pool of Yeshua, and he's trying to get into this water. Yeshua himself comes along and says, do you wanna be healed? 
The man gives a lame excuse that only the lame can do, and Yeshua said, I just said, do you wanna be healed? And so he, he heals the man and says, now pick up your bed and walk. He is telling him to literally break a law that the Pharisees put in place. A law that any of them could do, they could carry their bed because they could make the provision the day before the provisions necessary for them to be able to carry something. But that lame person, lame for the 38 years, he didn't have the opportunity to jump through these rabbinic hoops, which I shorthand called the law of the Eruv, Yeshua deliberately tells them to break. And so, immediately after he heals him and the man is carrying his bed, the Pharisees are outraged. They know this man. He's been there like for 38 years on this bed and now he's carrying his bed on the Sabbath. So the next day, Yeshua's up on the Temple Mount and he, they, they, the Pharisees' leaders are making plans how to kill him. Because not only had he been at Passover, now we have to just back up, Remember, Yeshua was baptized, 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. The temptation comes out of the wilderness, and John says, behold the lamb which takes away the sin of the world. Yeshua then picks up some of John's disciples, and then oh, Philip, then Nathaniel. Then on the third day, Yom Shlishi, the third day he's at a wedding in Cana where he deliberately defiles the Pharisees' ceremonial stone water pots, and his disciples see his judgments and believe on him. Then they go down with his family, down to Capernaum for not many days. Why not many days? Because now, the, just a few days from then, is Passover in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yeshua gets up to Passover that year. He has to be there by, by Thursday because Friday is when the Passover lambs are sacrificed. So they're gonna get up there as soon as they can. And then he goes in the temple and he overthrows the money changers uh, uh, tables in the temple and makes a whip and drives the animals that are being sold on top of the temple mount, which is not authorized by God, but the Pharisees made a special thing. And so th this causes them to absolutely erupt. And he says, by whose authority do you do this? And Yeshua said, I'll tell you by whose authority. Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Yeshua does miracles uh, not, uh, that are not defined at that time. He stays in the area, he baptizes, he meets with Nicodemus on Yom uh, Habikarim, the day of the first fruits, and that's when he tells Nicodemus, you're, you're a ruler uh, of, the, of the Jews and you don't know this, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And so now, the very next thing that happens, after that day, seven weeks later, seven Sabbaths later, he's up, he heals the man just before Shavuot. Now, on the Feast of Shavuot, he's up on the Temple Mount, and the Pharisees, because he has healed this man, it shows a divine miracle, and yet, Yeshua tells them to break a Pharisee law. They are so irate that they want to kill him. And so they're making plans on how to kill him. And this is when Yeshua then uh, speaks to them. Truly, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself, but that which he sees the Father do. For whatsoever things he does, so the Son does likewise. And so he's saying, you know, I've done this miracle and you marvel, and you're gonna see greater marvels than these. He said that, in verse 22, this is John chapter five, uh, verse uh, uh, 21. The father raises up the dead and quickens or makes alive whosoever he will. And so the son will quicken, make alive whoever he wills. For the father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment to the son so that men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Yeshua then tells him, I am going to raise the dead, and then I am going to judge everyone. God Almighty, the Heavenly Father, has given judgment into my hands. As the scripture says, Yeshua was tempted in all points like we, yet without sin. 
Yeshua is then thereby able to judge everyone because he has been tempted like we were, yet without sin. God cannot be tempted, neither tempteth he any man. But Yeshua was tempted, and so he is right in their face saying, I am going to raise the dead. And then he is going to judge everyone. Now, the very next time, uh, th this is the Feast of Shavuot, and the next time Yeshua goes up uh, to Jerusalem, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll say at Shavuot, this is when he finds out John has been put in prison, and so Yeshua leaves and goes up into the Galilee. At the end of the week, he reads the prophecy of Isaiah, saying to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closes the scroll. He does not continue reading about the day of judgment of our God because he's not here to fulfill that at that time. This is when he returns the next time. This is the part that the whole Christian world has missed, when he will sit in the tabernacle of David on the Ark of the Covenant and he will rule the nations from Jerusalem with a rod of iron. And so the very next thing that we see happen at the end of, the, of, of this period well, Yeshua goes up and leaves and goes up in the galley, begins teaching in the synagogue. Then it's the fourth month and the fifth month, and this is when he trains his apostles, his sent ones. The sixth month, he sends his apostles out and then has them gather, regather, and they get back together on Thursday just before the day of trumpets, uh, which will happen at sundown that Shabbat. So John chapter uh, six deals with him uh, feeding the 5,000 and then in the synagogue at Capernaum, that is when he teaches on the last day and the resurrection. And he says, I am the one that will raise the dead. I will raise them up in the last days. Over and over and over, I will raise them up in the last days. See, this is what the Christian world is missing. They wanna send people to heaven, but Yeshua is going to raise us up. He's going to gather us, and we will go to the sea of fire and glass. We will go to heaven, but we're not gonna stay there. He returns with us. See, Yeshua lays this out very clearly, and John is detailing this very thing. Then we get to the book of Revelation and it is John who is given the rest of the revelation. So these things all have to be understood in their context. Now, in Revelation, now we go to Revelation chapter 12 and this is the, uh, a, a, a chapter, Revelation 12, which is, a parentheses. The parentheses show cause and effect. They tie together that which has happened before to that which is happening in the future. And this particular one starts out with there being a great sign in the heavens. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon underneath her feet, and above her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child, cried travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. This was the great sign in the heavens that was seen on Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, just before Yeshua was born. She was travailing uh, to, to be delivered. This is the sign, the first sliver of the new moon beneath her feet, above the head of the constellation Betula, that is the a constellation of Ariel, the line of the tribe of Judah, and the the um, planet uh, Jupiter, which is Hatzedek, the righteous, came into conjunction with the star, which is between the feet of the lion, Ariel, the lion of, of Judah, and the star's name is Regulus, or Malak, the king. The king's star and the righteous planet came into conjunction at that moment, and that was the announcement on the day of trumpets of the birth of the righteous king, the lion of the tribe of Judah. She was about to be delivered, and she actually delivered, and Yeshua was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, when the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us, and Miriam gave birth to the Messiah in a tabernacle. The first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the high Sabbath, and because there's no room in the inn, she was relegated with her husband, Yosef, to give birth 
to the Son of God. What a scene that was. Eight days later, the circumcision of the child again happens on the high Sabbath, Hashanah Rabbah, the last great day. And there we have a a initial fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, but that Feast of Tabernacles is yet to be fulfilled in the future because Yeshua will reign upon the earth and everyone is required to go up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles to worship the king because it's his birthday party. Every episode of our international broadcast, we interrupt for two minutes to allow you, our viewers, to donate to this ministry. We monetize this ministry in no other way. We don't monetize it by empty promises that the Almighty is going to give you a condo on the Riviera, a yacht, or a Rolls Royce. We don't give you any of the hype. We're just saying that if this message has changed your life, if you have woken up to the fact that Yeshua is the Messiah and that we must hear and obey him and that he is the living Torah, the living word, then this is your opportunity to do what he said. Freely you have received. And at great expense to us, you have freely received. Now, this is your two minutes to freely give and give bountifully, give abundantly. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got one chance, one lifetime to get it to the world, and this is it. And this is your time. Revelation chapter 12 is one of the several parenthetical sections in the book of Revelation a parenthesis that shows cause and effect. It shows that which happened before and ties it to that which happens in the future. And this is one, it it seems a little complex to the ones who have not read the scriptures from Genesis all the way up to this point, but we see that this particular prophecy about the first sliver of the new moon appearing beneath the feet of the constellation Betula when the uh, when Jupiter, or Hatzedek, comes into conjunction with Regulus, which was seen on the day of trumpets just 15 days before the birth of the Messiah. She travailed in pain to be delivered, and she brought forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. We're going to continue reading this because this gives us some detail about the end right here in the book of Revelation. And there, in verse 3, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, another sign, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And this is a, you know speaking of Satan's original rebellion when his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. And actually, uh, Leviathan, the constellation, his tail encompasses about a third of the stars, the visible stars and planets that are seen in the heavens. That's what it looks like in the heavens even to this day. And it says that he did cast them to the earth. Satan acted in open rebellion against the one to whom he owed his allegiance. He led an organized uprising of angels and thought to overthrow their lawful ruler, God. He was able to deceive and to enlist the help of a third of the angels, which were then cast down to the earth. And they are the ones that the scriptures speak of as these demonic spirits. They are spirits, but they have gone to the other side. And it says that the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This literally happened where Herod, inspired by Hasatan, goes out to kill the Messiah. He goes out to kill Yohanan ben Zechariah, John the Baptist, and uh, unable to find him, he kills Zechariah, his father. He stands before, as Satan stands before the woman, ready to, to kill the male child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, to fulfill the second prophecy 
or the second chapter, this second Psalm, which David, who was a prophet who saw beforehand the coming of the Messiah, he defined this and described this Messiah who is to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And then it says, and her child was caught up to God into his throne. So here we have everything from before the birth to the birth to then the child being, the, the male, the male son being caught up to the throne of God, which is the ascension. So we've got that all in, encapsulated in here. And so you have to really go back and read uh, Matthew and Luke in its entirety to see the context of what this is talking about because this is real shorthand here. And then it uh, talks about uh, the woman fleeing in the wilderness where she has a place prepared for 1,203 score days. This is yet a future occurrence here, but we're gonna read the next verse. Verse seven, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, cast out of heaven. It takes a war in heaven. Satan is holding fast to his position as accuser of the brethren. Just as we saw in the book of Job, now we see in the book of Revelation. He accuses the brethren day and night. They are, he is bringing any sin, any transgression before the throne to accuse the brethren and he is doing it day and night until this war in heaven. Now this war in heaven is predicated upon the details of what happens in the fifth chapter of the book of the Revelation. And I'm gonna get into that in a little bit with you. But this right here where it says that, that Satan and his angels did not prevail and their place was not found in heaven anymore. He was cast out to the earth. And verse nine, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. It keeps on going with the list of names, however you wanna to refer to the prince of the power of the air. And he's the one that deceived the whole world. And he was cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now has come salvation and power and the kingdoms of our God and the power of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brethren has been cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they, the saints, overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. This is a future occurrence. This has not yet happened. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, and it says in verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you, he has be, and he has great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. He persecuted Israel, from whence the Messiah came. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time. In the book of Daniel, the same thing, for three and a half years same number of months. All the, the details are the same. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water like a flood after the woman that she might be carried away, but the earth helped. And so we see that the dragon, in verse 17, I think this is important, the dragon was wroth with, with the woman, went to war, make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua Messiah. These are the combatants. These are the warriors. These are the ones. They have the testimony of Yeshua and they keep the commandments of God. 
If you do not keep the commandments of God, you're not even in the battle. You say, oh, I love Jesus, but you don't do what he says to do. You don't love him, you just mouth it. You love the Jesus that you made up in your own mind, your eight pounds, six ounce baby Jesus. You, you don't love Yeshua. You don't love the Messiah enough to follow what he said to do. So here it is. Now I'm gonna go all the way to the book of Daniel. It just happens to be Daniel chapter 12 as well. At that time, at that time, shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness shall shine like the stars forever and ever and ever and ever. This is speaking of the resurrection. This is the time that Michael and his angels stand up in the great war in heaven. Satan is cast down to the earth. Their position that Satan has been holding fast to as the accuser of the brethren until he is taken out of the way, out of the midst, out of the throne room of God, he is cast down to the earth, and now sanctification has happened in heaven. But woe to the earth, because this is the time that we're gonna read about in Paul's letter to the believers in Thessalonica, and in the book of Revelation, and as Yeshua details this to three of his disciples on the Mount of Olives, this is the time that the abomination of desolation takes place. This is the time that the man of sin is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God so that he as God sits in the temple of God, declaring himself that he is God. But the word temple is not what you think. The word temple is not this big stone structure. It's not like Solomon's temple. It's not Herod's temple. This is the key to what must take place. And he says in that, remember, Paul says, remember not when I was with you, I told you all these things. Yeah, he told him all these things when he was with them. Paul is writing this letter with the help of Silas and Timothy. He's writing it from Athens because he, after leaving Thessalonica the first time, with almost losing his life, with the, with the mob from Thessalonica chasing him all the way down to Berea, then Paul has to get on a boat by himself and get out under the cover of darkness and gets out of the country across the sea with Silas and Timothy still behind. When Paul gets to Athens the first time, he then sends the boat back after him, said get back there and get them now, rescue them. And while they are going back to rescue them, Paul confronts the pagans in Athens and then has to flee Athens. Years later, he comes back to Athens and he writes these letters to the believers in Thessalonica. And this is why it is so important that we understand it because Paul was dealing with these people, he told them, as he said, remember when I was with you, I told you all these things about the man of sin, about him being revealed, about the timing of all this, and about the timing of the Lord Yeshua being revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and who obey not the gospel. He's talking about their, their rescue and what must take place first. These are the same things that we see in the book of Matthew, 
and we see in the book of Revelation, and we see as Paul writes to the believers in Corinth the very same things. To understand the context of Paul's letter to the believers in Thessalonica, we need to go back to the 17th chapter of the book of the Acts. It says in verse one, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica and there was a synagogue of the Jews. That's kind of redundant. If it's a synagogue, it's a Jewish synagogue. These are Pharisees, okay? And you, and uh, Paul is going in to these Pharisees. He has with him Paul, and uh, Paul has with him uh, Silas and Timothy. Silas is with him because he and Barnabas have already split up over a disagreement about whether they should take John Mark with them on this particular trip. And the dissension among them was so great that they departed one from another, and we don't really hear anything more about Barnabas after this. But it says that they went into the synagogue, and as his manner was, he reasoned with them three days out of the scriptures, opening and then alleging that Messiah must needs to have suffered and then risen from the dead. And this Yeshua, who he was preaching, is that very Messiah. So he was showing them from the Torah and the prophets, mainly the prophets, that the Messiah must fulfill that role as a suffering servant, not just as a reigning, conquering king. And it says some of them believed and then concerned with Paul and Silas and the devout Greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, the Pharisees, let's, let's call it like it is, but the Pharisees in that synagogue which did not believe, then they were moved with envy, and they took certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. They hired these people as instigators, as troublemakers, and they gathered a company and set the entire city in an uproar. And they assaulted the house of Jason and brought them out to the people. And so what happens in this, and uh, according to some of the writings of the early church fathers, this Jason may well have been uh, the nephew of Paul that they're staying at his house, and so they attack the house. All these people, they get an uproar, the, the heathen are raging because of what Paul is teaching. Now, you have to read the rest of the, of the account to understand what he is preaching because he is setting in contrast the Torah of God from the rules and regulations of the Pharisees. And they assault the house, they arrest men, and then they get Paul out of there, and Silas, and Timothy, they get them out in the dead of night and whisk them down to Berea as fast as they can get them out, just barely with their lives. Then they get down to Berea and they start teaching the synagogue again. And when the Pharisees back at Thessalonica and their lewd fellows of the baser sort, uh, these instigators, these rioters, uh, they then come down to Berea and then Paul has to be taken out by boat in the middle of the night again, and Silas and Timothy don't even come with him. It has to happen that fast. Paul is not able to get back there fast enough. He can never go back again because the persecution that ensues in Thessalonica, people are going to die. People are going to give their lives and live their lives. They are Jewish believers. They are Gentile believers. They believe in Yeshua. They are holding fast to the doctrine of what Shaul, what Paul taught them. And what he taught them while he was there was the very things that we're talking about. The things that are not even taught in church anymore. He had three weeks with them three weeks, and he is detailing the legal prerequisites to the return of the Messiah. He's telling them that, that the mystery of iniquity is already working, the behind the scenes Satan, the working of Satan, and that Satan is holding fast to his position of authority until he's taken out of the midst, and then, then he will energize the man of sin, the destroyer, 
with lying signs and wonders as he then takes the place where he ought not to sit because it is in the temple of God, proclaiming to himself that he is God, well, we're gonna find out that it's not really the temple as most people think. The third temple, building of the third temple is a fallacy. All the hype out of Israel, oh, the third temple going to be rebuilt and all, it's a fallacy. This is not what the prophets say. The prophets say, the tabernacle of David, which was hidden with the Ark of the Covenant, will be rebuilt. And the Ark of the Covenant, the cloud of glory, will be seen.